chapter seven of the two treaties on government, second treaties of John Locke, and uh, just point out a, a couple of paragraphs there. I'm not going to go into a long discussion uh, like I did in the previous section, so don't be afraid. Um, but I did want to point out a couple of things here that are, you know, pretty interesting, especially from the perspective of um, the Declaration of Independence of the United States. So I want to look at section 87, section 135, and section 136. Whoops, let's see here, 87. Okay. So section 87, man being born as has been proved with a little to perfect freedom, with a title to perfect free freedom. Okay, so it's talked about this before. And uncontrolled enjoyment of all the rights and privileges of the law of nature equally with any other man or number of men in the world hath by nature a power not only to preserve his property, that is his life, liberty and estate against the injuries and attempts of other men, but to judge of and punish the breaches of that law in others, as he is persuaded the offense deserves, even with death itself, in crimes where the heinousness of the fact, in his opinion, requires it. Okay. So he says that by nature, um, a person has the right to defend his life, liberty, and estate. So life is just the subsistence level of existence, like uh, in chapter five that I emphasize. And liberty is the ability to move about freely about, about the countryside and, um, and a state, which is property. So this is life, liberty, and property. And Locke is saying that um, for reasons that he explains in between here, between chapter five and chapter seven, is that um, there's a certain title of perfect freedom. And not only just freedom, but enjoyment. And that then gives people to protect their life, liberty, and property. If it's infringed upon by others, and that determination of, of the punishment or the degree to which one can use violence or coercion against another is dependent upon one's own estimation because uh, these are just natural rights. So he is building a, an argument for revolution. When there is tyranny, he's saying that when people are tyrannized and they're uh, life, liberty, or estate is infringed upon, they have the right to fight back. Okay, but, so now we see something that then in like colonialism, we could actually see Locke being used by indige indigenous Americans to justify their rebellion against uh, European colonizers. Okay, uh, so that's, a, that's important to keep in mind that he is introducing a lot of revolution ideas of revolution that then do get incorporated into like the United, the, the revolution of the colonial, uh, the colonies of the United States, uh, re uh, revolting and rebelling against England uh, directly out of this. And, uh, and, and then later uh, emancipation, uh, liberatory sort of, um, violent uprisings of people in the Americas later on and even to this day uh, can go back to Locke to provide uh, philosophical justification. Okay. Uh, let me continue because there might be something else in this paragraph that I wanted to mention. Mention, uh, but that life, liberty, and estate, life, liberty, and property then becomes in the Declaration of Independence 
life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which, which uh, is right here. The, you know, the, the founding fathers just uh, substituted property with happiness, uncontrolled enjoyment, um, still very consistent with what Locke is saying, uh, but avoiding maybe some of the trickiness of what the same property might have implied. Um, okay, so, but because no political society can be nor subsist without having in itself the power to preserve the property and in order there unto punish the offenses of all those of that society, there and there only is political society. Okay, so this is important. Where every one of the members hath, uh, hath quitted his natural power, resigned it up into the hands of the community in all cases that exclude, that exclude him not from appealing for protection to the law established by it. Okay, so what he's saying is that naturally people have the right to defend their own life, liberty, and property, but when you enter society, there is a kind of social contract that takes place where you give up that right to personally protect these things to the state or sovereign uh, in like along Hobbesian lines, but then part of the exchange is that you can make appeal to the law to protect your own life, liberty, and property. Okay. Uh, so that is <clears throat> important. But notice how important, um, how central property rights are to Locke's way of thinking. Okay, and thus all private judgment of every particular member being excluded, the community comes to be umpire by settled standing rules, indifferent and the same to all parties and by men having authority from the community for the exclusion of those rules, execution of those rules, decides all the differences that may happen between any members of the society concerning any matter of right and punishes those offenses which any member, member hath committed against the society with such penalties as the law has established, whereby it is easy to discern who are and who are not in political society together. Those who are united into one body and have a common established law in judicature uh, to appeal to will with authority to decide controversies between them and punish offenders are in civil societies one with another, but those who have no such common appeal, I mean, on earth are still in the state of nature, each being where there is no other judge for himself and executioner, which is, as I have before showed, the perfect state of nature. Okay. Uh, so there are people who are in society and can appeal to the law, but those are there are those who are outside of society and cannot appeal to law and therefore have to defend their own life and liberty. Um, again, he seems to be justifying settler colonialism and gen genocide at some level here. Uh, but this natural right stuff, I think a lot of us can get on board with. Uh, but there, are, and, and of course, in American society, a lot of Locke's ideas have been taken in a very right wing direction in terms of um, being a foundation for um, anarcho liberal uh, libertarianism, um, what we call libertarianism in the United States, um, a lot of the ideas come out of Locke and these ideas of property and appeal to natural right and, and things like this and, and question the legitimacy of sovereignty and things like that. Um, and so get taken in a weird right-wing direction, but a lot of socialists, uh, once you get past Locke's Eurocentrism and prejudices and and sort of 
sort of um, uh, lop off, <laughs> you know, these problematic parts, there is a core of, of con con concepts that uh, socialists can get on board with, um, but it just does need a lot of modification and, and you need to, uh, a socialist would need to protect themselves against falling into these right wing uh, prejudicial interpretations, which Locke himself seems to be doing. So you can't just take Locke uh, whole cloth as a socialist. Now, if you're, if you're a right winger, uh, then I guess there's no problem. Um, I'm assuming that most of us have some social uh, feeling. That's just typically the way it has been in higher education since I was a kid. Now that is changing. We do have lots of uh, anti-social uh, people in education nowadays, but it used to be that the anti-social people were 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 not um, were not part of the education project. But we do have anti-social people that are taking over public education, uh, and so this is. Uh, some of my assumptions here are, are, are maybe uh, offensive to some people, but in the past, when I was a kid, public education were, was for socialists. It's a socialist enterprise, and so socialist assumptions were made it, throughout education. Now, uh, people, right-wing anti-socialists who want to take over the public education project, um, they can infuse public education with anti-social ideas, but then ultimately the whole purpose is just to destroy public education. So there's a, a lack of legitimacy there. Uh, just at, at that level, we can see on the ground that that's the attempt that's being made right now. Um, but there are deeper, deeper philosophical issues. Okay, if you're for genocide, you know, if you're for Locke's justification of genocide, okay, then you got to argue for that. Um, I'm just assuming that most of us won't argue for that. But of course, you're welcome to be an anti-socialist. You're welcome to be for genocide. You're welcome to be, you know, whatever. Uh, but you do need to argue for it. And, and what I'm doing is I'm laying the groundwork of a common understanding that, you know, that was just, was not up for debate when I was a kid. Um, if you wanna put that up for debate, okay, let's debate it. Uh, but you have to start from a socialist, uh, at least a watered down liberal, you know, bourgeois liberal attitude, like coming out of the 19th century as I described in earlier lectures. <clears throat> if you're coming at it from a non liberal perspective, you know, you're not trying to ameliorate the harshest aspects of capitalism, or you're not trying to uh, eradicate genocide, and you don't want public education, and you want some theocratic uh, government, or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, these, I'm assuming a basic bourgeois liberal sort of socialism as, as, as like the basis of, of education as it's been known over the last uh, 100, 150 years. From the time of like Owenite socialism, we get public education and then, uh, you know, and that there's a similar story going on in the United States and, um, and even though, of course, the United States has not lived up to the bourgeois socialist liberal ideals, those have been the ideals that we discuss in public education. So if you're going to disagree with bourgeois liberal socialism, democratic socialism, um, <clears throat> then, then you need to make those arguments. You can't just assume a whole other, you know, coming from left field, uh, you know, uh, from the planet Mars or something. You've got to start from the common ground.
Okay, uh, but I, but I know I, I, and I'm not expressing super radical uh, leftist ideas. I'm just, I'm just projecting as an assumption, bourgeois liberal socialism at a very moderate uh, level. You know that comes from the perspective of capitalism. <clears throat> okay, one thirty five and one thirty six. Okay. So this is actually later on. We're all the way in chapter eight. 135, 136. Chapter nine. Chapter 10. Chapter 11. Okay, so. But I didn't want to read this section right here. Okay, section 135, though the legislative, whether placed in one or more, whether it be always in being or only by intervals, though it be the supreme power in every commonwealth, yet, okay, so the legislative, the parliament, he's thinking of parliament, whether it's, or, or the executive of a single person or a parliamentary body, whatever the case may be, um, though it be the supreme power in every commonwealth or every republic, okay, so this is, he's thinking from a Republican perspective. First, it is not, nor can possibly be absolutely arbitrary over the lives and fortunes of the people. Cannot be absolutely arbitrary. No absolute sovereignty in Hobbes' sense, whether it's parliamentary, Republican or monarchical, whatever, cannot have absolute arbitrary power for it being but the joint power of every member of the society given up to that person or assembly, which is legislator. It can be no more than those persons had in a state of nature before they entered into society and gave up to the community. The only power to be given is the, or the only rights of authority to be given by consent are the natural rights that existed in the state of nature, grounded in property acquired by labor uh, exerted. Um, <clears throat> For nobody can transfer to another more power than he has in himself. And nobody has an absolute arbitrary power over himself or over any other person to destroy his own life or to take away the life or property of another. A man has been proved, as has been proved, cannot subject himself to the arbitrary power of another and having in the state of nature no arbitrary power over the life, liberty, or possession of another. Okay, let's 